Have you heard about Jebit? Jebit is a platform that lets you create things like product matches, personality quizzes, gift guides, trivia, and more. These experiences are fully branded and easy to create and can be launched on any channel. D2C brand Pour Moi Skincare has been using Jebit for years and said, awareness, education, conversion, our Jebit quiz does it all. Start for free at tryjebit.com slash today. On with the show. Hello and welcome to the D2C podcast. I am Eric Dick with co-host Kyle Guilfoyle. And today we have a very special guest, a friend of mine, Dylan Carpenter, who is the host of uh, the podcast Rich Ad Poor Ad. He's doing a lot of interesting things. He's also uh, running an agency called Quality Media, I I believe we just said. Uh, Welcome to the podcast, Dylan. Uh, Just a quick story. I met Dylan at a mastermind in San Diego, I believe. Uh, or was it in Vegas? It was either Vegas or San Diego, maybe both uh, that you were at. Uh, but we hit it off. He is a dynamo in the space. He's he, he recently made a really interesting post about a brick and mortar business that he was able to help. So, so we brought him on to chat about the brick and mortar opportunity, uh, as well as a bunch of other things happening in the ad space. Welcome to the DTC podcast. Dylan, how you doing? Good, man. That was an intro. I'm kind of amped right now. <laughs> like, That's the goal. That's the goal with the <laughs> intro. They usually just, uh, they're, they're prepared in the 30 seconds before the podcast, but, but that's how they go. Uh, I wanted to ask you just right off the top, like you, you seem, you have your hands in a lot of different things. Uh, you're you, you, a lot of different projects. I wanted to ask you, what is your, what is your zone of genius? Like what is your superpower as, as a marketer in this space? Um, I think sales, I'm being honest. So I kind of, I love Facebook and Instagram ads. And I mean, it's all human behavior kind of style. So I went to college for marketing with a sales concentration and I randomly fell at, you know, working at Facebook downtown. So, I mean, I realized what the value of it was. I was talking to agencies who were doing, you know, crazy numbers. So I was able to kind of realize what I was getting into pretty quick. It's where I kind of became a sponge. Of course, Adderall came into phase and I learned a ton, but I mean, (laughs) My, I, you know, I, one of my skills at Facebook though, it was pretty salesy. So I was talking to beginners, intermediate and advanced. So I think my communication skills really give me a good leverage. Cause when it comes to talking to prospects, clients, or even guys like you, I can kind of gauge where anyone's at and kind of really speak to their language to kind of help them understand, because you know, this industry is crazy with acronyms and all these weird lingos and whatnot. But then of course, you know, I run a lot in ads. So I do a lot of testing. I have, you know, 15 different brands we run ads for. So I use all of those for other accounts, you know, how to kind of launch them. This is working here. Here's over this. Here's for this account. But I mean, at the end of the day, if you were to look at my accounts, it's, it's all creative oriented. You know, the algorithm is smarter than most media buyers. I'll, yeah, I have no problem saying that. So, I mean, we just interchange creative like crazy to where most of our, you know, scaling campaigns are just really broad audiences. So I think my big skill sets are kind of just how I communicate with clients and, you know, potential prospects, as well as understanding the Facebook algorithm and the kind of back in the system to really kind of make it go full circle. Cause I'm all about transparency. Um, I hate the guys who kind of, you know, I will guarantee you, you know, it's 10 X out of the gate where I'm like, Hey, this may, here, here's the max minimum and average we can get you. I'm going to be realistic here. It may take two or three months. It could be a week. It could be four months, but I mean, I'm just kind of a, a different breed. I feel like when it comes to how I operate in the digital marketing realm, just for my attitude and kind of personality, I think. I love it. Uh, and, 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 you, and you have the paradigm correct or the, or the paradigm that we believe in anyways, which is that you have to feed the machine and you can't, you have to constantly creatively iterate. And, and it's part of that. It's part of that communication skill, whether you're communicating with the, the algo on the back end or communicating through the ads, I can see that definitely being a, a, a superpower of yours. I wanted to just dial in just cause we're calling this the brick and mortar opportunity. I want to dial in a little bit on, on give us an example of a brick and mortar company that you've worked with that just absolutely slayed in, 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 with Facebook ads? Yeah. So for 2020, we'll say it was a moving company called undergrads. You know, I came across these guys, you know, shoot early last year or now technically, and it probably took us three or four months to work together, but these guys were killing it on Google. They were getting a really mean return. And, you know, they asked me to audit their Facebook account. They were just boosting posts and whatnot. And they were probably spending a thousand bucks a month. And I'm like, Hey, I could turn this baby around. So like, even in the first month of working with them, I want to say it was like in August, we spent 5k and generated 291 leads. Um, let me see how many actually converted off those. So, I mean, yeah, over 150 sales from those leads generated 60k in sales. So month one, we had a 12x. 
So after that, they were like, oh, this is really working well for us. And the funniest part is they only had like three or four cities at that time. So I mean, it's not my normal cup of tea. I like broad targeting with large audiences. So I'm over here trying to do some different things. Um, but the other issue is, you know, the, they didn't have much data. So, I mean, for targeting, I was doing the Zillow interest, broad, you know, of course, you know, home buying kind of side of things, um, you know, remodeling, Home Depot, Lowe's. I was just doing a bunch of random interest and they ended up kind of hitting the spot pretty quick. But, you know, we went for leads. We weren't going for sales. That's where all the data was. So, you know, out of the gate, we started with the leads, then moved to purchase over time. But there really wasn't a month we got under 5X. I mean, of course, their slow time of the year, they were pretty, you know, around 5x but they're in those hot months it was easily 10x you know on that return on ad spend i think the leads are key there they i think that's that's the one thing that local businesses really need to take advantage of like you know you can drive foot track traffic into restaurants or or into into stores and there i guess there's ways of tracking that i'm not i'm not fully familiar but really you've got to you've got to get their email address and and sell them on the back end what were you involved in the sales cycle on the back end at all or were you just straight selling leads so they had a call, they had a call center. So they were just every single lead we got, they made a call immediately. So it was a, it was a good fine tuned process. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it did take a couple hiccups. Luckily we use call rail for phone tracking to realize some of these people calling weren't the nicest people out there. So I was like, yo, I don't know who this lady is, but she was just rude on this call. So we would kind of optimize the phone calls and like what to say, kind of give them a script more or less there, but we didn't implement their systems. And we kind of just gave a lot of advice on there because I mean, if the ad, like, the ads were working, the front end metrics were killer. The cost per lead was killer. So I was like, rather than us revamping an entire strategy, thinking it's the ads, let's focus a little bit more on the back end. It'll be a little bit cheaper, most likely. We're not going to have to re-optimize and relearn this new stuff. So that ended up being a lot easier of a transition to ultimately add more to the bottom line. It sounds like you were really helping them with the, the full stack, which I think um, is a big risk with especially um, many local businesses who don't necessarily know the whole Facebook ads world and that it's not often going to, it's not always going to get you like a quick return. It's really like a a process. Like you said, it takes, you know, sometimes two to four months or whatever. Um, so, so what was, sorry, what was that tool that you said you used, uh, for, for, uh, looking at the calls? Oh, call rail. Call rail. Have you ever heard of that, Eric? Call rail. I think I've heard of call rail. Yeah. Okay. That's super cool. I'm, I'm curious about, um, cause you said you had a bit of an aha moment when you were looking at their, their ads, uh, in the first place that, that they were just boosting posts. Was there, was there anything that you, um, remember seeing that like just screamed, Oh, this is a huge opportunity other than the fact that they were just boosting posts. Yeah, they had a really good offer. So it's labor only moving. They get college kids, cheap labor. I love it. I would have done it in college. So, I mean, the concept behind it was really good. And I know I've moved maybe four times and I usually always pick the third or fourth floor, of course. So I hate moving. So I've, I've probably spent, you know, three or 4K on moving. And whenever I was seeing their average order value being in that three to $400 realm, I'm like, this is honestly a lot cheaper than I was expecting. So once I saw they already knew a little bit about ads, they're already spending money. It was kind of more of how their offer and kind of service more or less work to be like, this is actually a really good one. I can kind of ramp up. So I think my key findings there were kind of finding a unique business to kind of really the kind of, you know, not take advantage of, but use their assets to kind of really get in front of the right audience on Facebook. And then of course they're already spending money on ads. So I know they have, you know, the, the cash flow to do that, but also have a basic understanding knowledge of what the ads can kind of do there. And they were boosting for like probably four or five months. And they're like, the first month was killer. Then it crashed. I'm like, that's what Facebook does. You know, they make the first couple kind of good. And then of course, boom. So yeah, I mean, they had great creative, you know, just dudes trucking out, you know, couches with mom in the background. So, I mean, everything looked good, but their structure to where I was like, oh, I could, I could definitely take this and run with it, basically. Awesome. Um, I'm also super curious because you, you have experience both in local and e com. Um, would you be able to, to distill like some key differences between running ads for the two? Yes. So, on a local level, I get a lot more targeted. Um, and it depends on your industry as well. If you're in the special ad category for housing employment, <laughs> good luck. That's a fun one. That's for another conversation there. Um, but with wait, wait, wait. Of- have you tried? Oh yeah. Yeah. So we do a um, mortgage refinance leads for veterans. So that's all a special ad category. So I'm using like lookalikes based off the special ad category and all that stuff, but yeah, it works great. We get leads for shoot eight to $10 there. And we, we probably spend three K a month and he probably closes about 20 K a month, but and that's the only account I have on special ad category right now. But Sorry, I interrupted you. 
No, you're good. I, I forgot where I was at, to be honest. <laughs> well, you're, you're distilling the differences between, um, you know, running ads for e-com versus uh, local. Yeah, so local versus e- um, e-com. Um, being more local, I usually don't go as broad. I do to an extent, but I also break up a lot of different audiences. Because, I mean, if I go broad on a local level versus, you know, e-com or national level, that's going to be like 5% of the audience. So, I mean, it's not very big. So, where when I'm running these conversion campaigns, it's really only finding like 10 to 20% of those people who are most likely going to take that action. So, over time, those broad audiences kind of die out. So, I do test a lot of, you know, more basic interests, demographics, job titles on a local level, just to kind of diversify it a little bit because there's not much room for the algorithm to work there. On the e-com side, if it's nationwide, I'll stack these babies to 30 million plus. I'll go broad with zero targeting, maybe adjust the ages a little bit. So the targeting is a lot different there. And I want to say we get higher frequency on the local side of things. So it always depends on budget there, but I mean, even so for a guy who spends 5k on, you know, local legion and 30k a month for a random e-com brand, we probably cycle the same amount of creative every single week um, or every other week. If we're spending more than 30k on the e-com side, it's a little bit more rapid, but if it's an e-com brand spending, you know, five or 10k a month, I'm probably not going to interchange the creative as much just because it's on a local level. And I know it's that first time impression ratio is still pretty high there, meaning the people seeing the ads for the first time is still, you know, pretty fresh still i'd say awesome i'm uh keep saying things that make me curious um yeah. so uh the whole the the approach to going really broad on your on your um gtc ecom campaigns uh i think is something that uh a lot of people I, I still think a lot of folks default to oh i gotta you know get you know surgical with my targeting uh build lookalikes blah 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 blah, blah. could you would you be able to talk a bit about the the broad approach that you have Yes, it really only works if you have a good amount of data and a good offer and good copy and good creative. So I don't really do it too much for newer brands. Like I launched one in December and our broad targeting just wasn't working. And now it shockingly is after 25 sales. So it's still pretty freaking fresh there. But the biggest thing I can kind of think of here is whenever I try and and I'm guilty of this to where I try and, you know, hack the algorithm, get too nitty gritty. You know, I have too many exclusions and a good example is retargeting. So I used to love doing one day, three days, seven day, 14 day, 30 days to where it's kind of a customer journey retargeting side, which used to freaking kill it, but now it just doesn't. So I just kind of go more generic with 30 day and it's, you know, gives Facebook a little bit bigger of a pool. Our CPMs are lower and it's a lot more consistent versus trying to get really granular with it. Um, same way on the top of funnel side, if I start adding in too many exclusions for, you know, Facebook engagers, site visitors, exclude add to car users, I really only exclude purchasers and 30 day site visitors to kind of play it safe and simple there. But I found the more audiences I try and, you know, add in there, whether, unless it's a huge audience size, but the more I try and, you know, really tell Facebook what to do, the worse it does, it seems like. So we've really kind of grown to versus audience testing. It's more creative testing to where, a good way to put it is if we have a sleep product, um, maybe the angle working for us right now is, hey, this is the best pill right here to you know fall asleep immediately. So where that's one angle, but rather than testing different audiences, I'd rather just go for two different angles on that specific product where it could be, are you tired of getting up in the middle of the night to go pee? Boom, I got a whole new pocket there or fall asleep and stay asleep. So where those three different angles, I could use the exact same creative, but different kind of hooks on the actual copy side of things with the exact same audiences. But depending on who's clicking on those ads, the ads are optimizing themselves. So they're hitting different pockets, depending on which kind of calls you out the most there. So you said it there, which calls you out. And I was writing about this in our year ender just last week about how the angles sort of find the people, as opposed to this idea of like, you're going to narrow target and find, you know, use all these targeting things, which are going like angles are never going to be more important after iOS 14, right? Like angles when, when all of the, tar- when it, you know, the ang- angles will have to do a lot more of that heavy lifting in a way. Right. Um, you know, potentially at, at that, at that point, I, I, I do, I would love to get your, some, some top level thoughts for, about iOS 14 from you as well, but I wanted to stay on local just for another question here. You mentioned you also worked with restaurants. I don't know how many restaurants are listening or how many we have on the list. I know we have a ton of food companies, uh, and, and things like that, but I was, I was curious what your relationship looked like with the, with the restaurant and how that worked. Yeah, it's hard. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, there's a uh, Matt Plapp, this guy I would recommend if you're looking to, you know, jump in the restaurant game, he's probably the best resource out there. I met him maybe three years ago at the many chat conference. So I had shiny object syndrome. I heard about chatbots. sounded really cool. I love robots. Let me try it out. So I jumped on that bandwagon really quick. Um, 
fast forward to today, it's changed so much. Facebook changed their rules. Many chat changes their rules. I don't want to keep up with it. So basically on the restaurant side of things, all we do are specific offers to where it's like, hey, claim a free appetizer, get a free drink here, get a free dessert. You claim that via the chat bot, which then goes to a Google spreadsheet. So we have to kind of cross correlate these things with offline conversions, basically, which is not fun in my opinion. So we basically kind of get that initial lead for, of course, the appetizer, they show it to their waiter, boom, the waiter clicks a button on the actual messenger itself. They can't use that anymore, but then we have sequences that go over time. So we can actually track if they've been in there more than, you know, one time, two times, three times. And, you know, if they've been there five times, we give them a really special reward, like, you know, half off your dinner or something basically. So on the restaurant side, it's more to kind of get awareness out there, which stems from creative. Restaurants are different to where I'll go broad. I don't really care. You know, I'm not trying to Everyone hit needs. You know, veterans specifically. Yeah. So I can go really broad there. So it's more of just really badass food creatives and then a good offer saying, hey, we'll give you our cheesy bacon fries valued at $12 for free when you come in this week only. So if I show you some cheese fries, you're like, damn, this look pretty good. You go into the chat bot, you click redeem offer. You're now in our chat bot. And we have some other ones where we'll go for phone numbers or emails to kind of give them alerts, but it's really having them opt in. So we have them on the omni-channel approach side of things. But yeah, it all stems from an offer. And then of course, some crazy follow-up sequences. But the hardest part was setting up the back end to be able to show this person's been in here once, twice, three times to where I had to use other people's kind of third party systems for that. Cause I just don't know how to do it, you know, personally. Yeah. It's, that's, that's super cool. I actually work with a couple of restaurants as well. And, um, uh, something that works well, um, which I'm, I'm sure you've done before is, uh, because your audience is small it's, or smaller, especially like we're in Victoria, BC, which only has a population of like, I don't know, 380,000 people, um, are just, uh, just special event, uh, ads. So like you can always have like a birthday ad going where Facebook is targeting folks who have upcoming birthdays and just give them a special deal or like an anniversary. Um, that's, I've seen that work really well as well. Um, but yeah, that's super cool. Um, I like it. but one, one other thing too, just, just to unlook a little bit more. So, you know, I, I've talked about a friend of mine who, who runs that. He got an opportunity to, he was working with a, sort of a big old school freezer uh, seafood company. And uh, he, he basically started listening to the podcast. And, and so he got this, he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to pitch this company on building them a D to C brand. And he's, he built them a, a D to C brand, which is this lighter, cooler, you know, d direct to consumer brand where, where now he's shipping, you know, and, and delivering seafood, frozen seafood across the island. And he's just crushing these gold targets. So I'm always interested uh, and and your your moving uh, company example is a really good example of, a well as well of sort of finding those situations where there's really where where Facebook really is like a superpower like they're you know for a lot of local businesses done right you know restaurants may might be tough you know but but uh, for anyone listening to this who's got a business who's you know you know thinking about about running Facebook ads like what are the you know what are you looking for you know in clients that you would work with locally essentially. So these days, cash flow is a little more of an issue, I feel like, so, but it's a topic that needs to be discussed. Um, I then kind of dive into their, I, so for me, like whenever I work with a client, I'm like, cool, what's your cash flow? What are your break even metrics? What's something that makes you happy? What are some good offers and how's your creative? So, I mean, on the restaurant side, I think it's creative. I'd want them to have a good organic front. They're posting consistently. Cause I mean, I know I can repurpose that. And if they're doing good organically, I know I can scale them pretty hardcore on the, you know, actual paid ad side of things. So of course, you know, some sort of budget, but also kind of a basic understanding of Facebook. And to some extent, cause it's a lot of education on the platform where, Hey, I'll put five bucks and what's going to happen. It may come back today. It may take three months to come back. So, I mean, it, I really do a lot of self, you know, we're just kind of explaining of kind of how it works, the different scenarios. Um, case studies, of course, just because, you know, they don't, a lot of them don't understand that. So where they just kind of understand this, the Groupon side of things, that's another good angle. If you want to find some quick businesses to kind of run ads for, go on Groupon, they're paying a fee for that. It's a very easy lead there. So I did that a while <laughs> back when I left Facebook, kind of took probably 10 to 15 businesses from Groupon and like, hey, I see you have ads on here. I bet you can try this and do way better. And that worked pretty solid there. Um, I got, I got, Man, I got sidetracked. I'm sorry. That's okay. It's <laughs> all good. Um, yeah. What about what What about budget? How How does that How does that differ um, for for local businesses? Yeah. So I mean, I really recommend fifty bucks a day minimum on the local business side. I mean, it's fifteen hundred bucks a month. That's like if they're not doing anything to where 
I mean, we could do a thousand bucks a month. Cause I mean, it depends on what kind of restaurant it is a high class, you know, not as expensive because that's going to determine the lead cost. It also depends on the offer and the creative there. So I really, even on the e-com side, if I'm launching a brand and I recommend a hundred bucks a day minimum, cause you can hundred percent learn from a hundred bucks a day, regardless of where you're at. But I don't think, you know, many startup restaurants may have that. So where $1,500 may be a little bit easier on them and they can kind of probably see a quicker result from that. So where, Hey, let's try that for three months versus the old three K to where, you know, it gives them more of a proof of concept, which is a lot of the times what they need. The other thing mm -hmm. I think, um, needs like they, they often need ed education on is, um, cause you say 1500 bucks, but that that's not all they're spending, right? They're going to spend on your services as well too. Right. So oh, yeah. how, how do you, how do you navigate that, that conversation? Cause I think that applies to all, all businesses who have, don't have a lot of experience running ads. Yeah. So that's when I pull out the case studies and different kind of use cases. Cause as mentioned, I'll never guarantee results. You know, if somebody's, you know, spending a good pretty penny and they're doing pretty good, I can usually kind of estimate what I can get it at, but I'm just really upfront. Hey, here's an account that took three months to get going. Here's one that took a week. Here's one that took five months. It's kind of case by case in these scenarios. I think, yeah. And if I think they're going to have issues, we'll go in and revamp their offer. We'll reshoot their creative. We'll do all of that. Um, we don't have a problem because we're not going to, you know, make somebody pay us if we're just trying to make a pretty penny we want to make them some money there because as you mentioned the retainers aren't cheap there so i mean if they're spending 1500 bucks a month we want them to get at least a 4x minimum to kind of at least make a little money with that including the retainer for the most part but yeah that's a trickier conversation there because it's, it's expectations you know i find being really upfront and just really transparent hey i'll take you into an account right now and kind of give you you know the rundown of how it was the first month for them it may not be the same scenario but we're going to implement the exact same strategy to try you know and replicate this to where people like the upfront and honest side of things and that's just kind of been the way i've been kind of going about things makes and sense at, on, on that on, local, oh, go ahead. sorry you go ahead you go ahead so Y'all are both in Canada over there. Y'all like A and W root beer. It, it A and W root beer like owns this island that we live on. It's like I was it's, running it's their big... ads for a while, man. And oh we yeah, in Canada. We were doing franchise leads and like some of their local restaurant stuff. But that was that was a really fun account. But they wouldn't do any chat boss stuff. So I don't have any fun things to share with them, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the other education piece is really about how to go that last mile with brick and mortar businesses so with, with the, with the pixel, it's easy. You're tracking, you got your conversions, you got, you know, your, your conversion events, but, but figuring out that actual chain of conversion that you kind of described with that restaurant where they're literally having to go on messenger in that sort of piece has got to be a real tough stumbling block. I think for a lot of uh, a lot of local businesses and then a lot of agencies that, that work with them as well. So what's the simplest thing that the most businesses can do? It's straight up. It's gotta be just straight up lead gen, I guess. Right. Yeah. Find a good offer. So, you know, Ooh, here's a good one. So we love using our, you know, customer you know, communities, groups, whatnot. So rather than me coming up with an offer, I can come up with some offers, but I'm also not your target audience probably. And it sounds good in my head, but we'll just straight up ask all customers, Hey, what's something, if you, if you didn't know who we are, what would get you in our doors? I think that would be the biggest key takeaway. Do a sample size of a hundred people, see what's most common and test one or two of those. I think that would be the easiest thing. And, and it's free too. maybe like, Hey, a customer came in, Hey, what brought you here? And then just kind of get a good little survey sample size and kind of build off that. And then of course I would say organic. Um, I would probably focus a little bit more on organic out of the gate versus the paid side to kind of get some data. But that's also because I understand kind of how it works to where I would say two or three months of just really aggressive organic posting comments, you know, sharing, tagging different businesses, trying to get some more branded kind of partnerships going on there. And then of course I'd probably let the ads you know, run wild. Do you, and do you help with uh, on the organic side as well? I don't. I'll probably be offering it for the new year, but I typically just give advice. Like I have comment moderation guidelines, you know, so I have, I have way too many SOPs and like stuff from just like white label days and like just resources. So I give them everything they need to kind of get started. And to your point, Eric, on the process for kind of getting somebody to redeem these offers, we have to go in and role play typically um, to each person working there, give the lady at the front desk, the cashier, an idea of how this works, what to click on, what happens if this kind of fails. Um, so it's, it's a full three to four hour kind of just once, you know, but three, three to four hour ordeal. Interesting. Which is why you're looking for those big multinational scaling, you know, opportunities where you don't have these hurdles uh, to kind of go over things and, and, and sort of in that vein, I'm just interested on your, what are your top level thoughts about this, this iOS 14 uh, update coming? 
Yeah, I'd love to give a shout out to Nick Shackelford. I'm about halfway through reading his 35 page document. Um, yeah. It's a lot. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, but I'm not stressed too much just yet. I mean, the way I see it, I've had to adapt for a couple of years, like with Facebook ads. So, I mean, if anything, it's going to weed out the low quality advertisers. Cause I mean, I think we all saw, you know, Q3 reports from Facebook with like 2 million more advertisers and 1 million less users where it's like, that shouldn't, that shouldn't happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. So, I mean, I think it's going to be kind of Darwin is about its finest there from, you know, a good standpoint, but I think it's going to cost people to be more aggressive with ads, which I'm kind of into. Um, I think the biggest thing I'm worried about though, is the retargeting. I, I was reading, it can only go back seven days possibly. So mm. where that would suck. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's just going to involve more, you know, adapting on your ad copy and your, you know, funnels in the back end. And that content, but, right. That keeps people clicking and re-engaging that, you know, even if they're not going to buy that, it just makes content and angles and, and storytelling through your brand that much more important. And data. I would say everybody get your own email list. I, I wish I started sooner, but I mean, I think everybody should have an email list, whether it's for your agency or personal brand, a business or a client you work with, give them the advice to start doing something to build a list. Cause I've audited so many accounts and I used to hate email marketing, but of course I met the legend Chase Diamond himself. And I was like, damn, you make a lot of money from this. And I never realized it was that fruitful still. So, I mean, when I see people doing, you know, five or 10% of the revenue via email, I'm like, dude, you can easily get maybe 25 or 30% if you're really good. So, I mean, it's, you know, email list, killer cell phones. Like we were doing um, some stuff with Cristiano Ronaldo selling some underwear and we had a chat campaign. So it was to win a free signed, you know, pair of boxers from Cristiano Ronaldo and we were getting leads for 20 cents, but it was an SMS campaign and they couldn't buy online or anything. It was all to their phone and whatnot, but that was really fruitful as well. Very interesting. So what, what are you focused on in like, how are you, it's funny, we're, we're doing these resolutions that some of our, our, our past podcast get, uh, guests gave us. Uh, and one of the, one of the interesting ones was about focused and avoiding shiny object syndrome. And, you know, you sound like a multifaceted person that's able to take on all these different kinds of challenges. Like what are you going to do in 2021 to limit your shiny uh, or just to go after the right shiny objects, I guess. Yeah. So I was doing white label ads for a while. I did it for two years. I left. So explain that. Explain that exactly. So that means that you're someone else is white labeling your ad buying. Exactly. So I left Facebook with five accounts. I lost two. I freaked out. I'm like, shit, I need some agency work. So an agency kind of found me. They were doing white label Google PPC. So an agency would essentially hire our white label agency to run all the ads for their clients. So we would charge them a thousand bucks. They would charge their clients 2,500 to where they're, ma they're making money, but they're not the ones actually, you know, implementing everything. Mm -hmm. And I did that for probably two years. I got them well over 700 accounts, built multiple teams in there, a ton of SOPs, but I got burnt out. It's a volume-based model. I dreaded it after a while. So this year I kind of focused more on the freelance side of things. I've had my agency quality media for like three years now, but I've kind of hit a cap on my personal side of things. And I kind of want to scale up because shiny object syndrome is a real thing. And I want to keep time for that. So now I'm looking, I just hired a videographer. I'm hiring a copywriter, some other media buyers, some Google media buyers, um, one more for Facebook and Instagram. So it's kind of more to just build out my team to kind of get to that next level on the agency side of things. Cause I have all the processes, the SOPs, the kind of more of the credibility side to where I'm just capped out personally. So I hated agencies, but now I'm kind of like back in the agency game. Cause I know I've kind of capped out the freelance side of things. So for me, it's more of delegating tasks and paying people for it, I guess you can say, <laughs> versus yeah, trying like to it. do it all. <laughs> are there, um, I like it. are there, I, th I think it's, it's worthwhile to, to dive into that a little more because we do have quite a few agency uh, owners who, who listen to the cast. Um, and, and I think burnout is, is a big, is a big risk. I think another question is also, um, do I, do I continue down this agency road or do I, you know, do I build products? Um, for example, um, so you're not always having to react to, to other people's problems. Um, are there some other ways in addition to standard operating procedures and uh, building a team that you're looking at scaling? Have you thought of info, for instance? I, 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 always, I always feel like you're someone that, that would, could really benefit from an info arm as well. I've never tried it. I mean, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I partnered with a brand. So one of my clients, they have another brand and we're going to 50-50 it. So that's pretty exciting. But I mean, I've always wanted to launch my own brand, um, my own course. It'll be outdated by the time it's done or something. So yeah. the course idea is out the window. I also don't want to be one of those guys, unfortunately, um, and kind of put the time into it, maybe have a backfire or some shit. Because you, you see my car, man, I'll be doing donuts for dumb shit, you know, and oh, look at this guy. But... <laughs> 
But yeah, I mean, I already kind of forgot the question, if I'm being honest. <laughs> so are you looking at other ways of scaling in addition to building out your team and your standard operating procedures? Yeah. So more angel investing, I've been kind of getting more into that and not like heavy, maybe like 5k, nothing too crazy to where there are a lot of startups that I see potential and I can usually gauge of like, this could be really big. It's where they've been active for three months. It's, it's an easy win for them to get more ad spend. So the angel investing side is kind of what I'm ramping up on. Of course, um, I could talk on crypto, but that's not for the show. Crypto has been a fun one for me. Um, but I'm kind of just getting more into like investing side of things outside of what I'm doing. Cause I mean, it's, it's nice having a surplus of cash, but when it's not earning you anything in a bank, I'm like, what else can I do with it? So what's your best crypto tip for, for anyone listening? Everyone's on the fence. Don't take my advice. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, my mind's like my, I got Ethereum to do them pretty high. I think Ethereum will be good. I mean, Tesla's always, I think Tesla's going to be killer after the split that made me so much fucking money. But I mean, I, the worst part is I had Coinbase and I had a good amount of Bitcoin and Ethereum in there. And probably three or four months ago, there was some sketchy stuff going on with Coinbase. And I'm like, I don't even want to deal with this. It's not doing anything. So I, I sold a good amount of it. And then of course this freaking habit to skyrocket. So I'm like, damn it. I'll probably get back in it, but I don't, I, I'm by no means. No, like, I just kind of have extra cash to throw and hope it goes up, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's very cool. I don't, I don't know much about crypto, but b- back to Eric's point about uh, info and stuff. I mean, what, what about like selling all your standard operating procedures or you could just give them to our audience? I've done that. I've given away so many case studies to where it got annoying to where I had, you know, random agencies showcasing my case studies and I got freaking pissed to be honest. So I've, I haven't dove too much into it, to be honest. I mean, if I could find a good opportunity to, to find somebody who knows kind of how to help me structure it, I would have no problem because I mean, I love being on camera, just, you know, talking shop and just doing all these small things. It's just, I don't know if I would understand how to kind of get started, what maybe use a course style or I really don't know. But Interesting. yeah, I've wanted my own product for the longest time because I've making other people money, but I just don't want to have to find a product, then build the website and do all these other things. So, I mean, when these guys came to me like, hey, we have a product, the site's built out, everything's good to go. I'm like, cool, I can adjust a couple of things and get going. So it was a lot easier cash flow on my end to kind of dump it all on ads versus all the buildup side of things. But I just, man, and, and I've wanted to kind of join some other affiliate stuff to kind of, you know, diversify a little bit, but I just haven't, you know, pulled the trigger on any of it yet. I think the big hack on the agency side is something we're constantly focused on at Pilot House is just, it's all about the client. It's, and it's not, you know, it's, it, it could be, a, it, whether it's a really big client or a, or a client that you can just have maximum impact on, right? That you can have, and, and, and you know, way, the way we work on performance, you can actually then benefit the most as well. Um, so, so, so it's like client selection and just finding those right clients. And, and cause you were just saying like, you were, you know, when you're putting out as many, as much content as you are, you, you're going to find yourself in a position where you're turning clients away and you really got to get good at finding the right clients. Like you mentioned being sort of naturally good at that. I was wondering if you, can you talk a little bit more about like really how you, how do you, how do you generate interest? And then how do you choose the ones? Yeah. Just normal conversations like this. Yeah. So like they think they're interviewing me, but I'm really interviewing them. If I'm being honest, it's like, it's so like, I mean, I did so many interview things in college to where I, I kind of like got it down. I, I loved going to interviews and stuff. So I kind of just kind of take that mentality and go into these calls like that. <clears throat> so, I mean, it, it is exciting being able to say no to people. I think that's a, a big step in the right direction without a doubt. Cause I've listened to my gut numerous times to where I'm like, man, this guy just seems sketchy. I, there's something weird about it. And then I, you know, pulled the plug on I'm like hey it's not going to work and then all of a sudden stuff blows up on his and I'm like man I dodged a bullet there so I mean I think trusting your gut's huge there but I'd rather find somebody who has a unique product who's open-minded and you know eager to learn who has you know some solid cash flow or something that's already kind of working and then run from there so it's more of I, want, I like vibing with people I work with I mean I can literally it's weird to say, but I could probably get drinks with like any single one of my clients. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of weird, but we have that kind of relationship to where, I mean, I think last year I lost three accounts and one was performance wise. The other just went to monster agencies. So I don't really lose clients too much, but it's also, I'm a freelancer. I'm expecting on the agency model, the churn is going to be a little bit more without a doubt. So yeah, I love the white glove service. I'm all about client, you know, relationships there and I think that's a big perk of kind of what I do because I'm just overly transparent there which hey maybe they like it maybe they don't but I haven't had any issues just yet with it it's a simple hack and it's funny I think think of Dave talking about Dave the founder and the person who's hired all the people for for pilot house it's it's about like 
do I find this person annoying? Well, the client will find this person annoying, you know, like there's so much of, of those personal decisions that are made, you know, made on the relationship you develop w- with the people in the space. And it doesn't steer you wrong often, you know, like in, in a lot of ways. And there are so many great people in the space. It's a great, great place to be. Yeah. I think my biggest nightmare was I didn't trust my gut one time and I sent him the invoice, you know, I was getting started on the ads and all of a sudden my inbox is flooded daily. And I'm like, dude, this guy's a nightmare. So like before we even launched the ads, I'm like, Hey man, I don't think it's going to work. I'm going to go ahead and refund you. And he freaked the fuck out. (laughs) Like I was like, Oh my God, I never want to deal with that again. So now I'm just really upfront in the beginning to where it's not as bad of like, Oh man, screw you kind of style versus you led me on for a while. (laughs) So, you know, you kind of have to go through those things. And I mean, the same thing happened this year, you know, I went to Tulum, you know, I was like, I told my clients, Hey, I'll be, you know, I'll be managing ads still for a little bit, but then some are like, Oh, he's on vacation. I don't want to pay him for being on vacation. So it's kind of, how you word things as well. And I, I'm still learning. I mean, I'm 26. So I mean, you know, kind of learn as you go, but it's interesting because it's kind of really, it's the emotional things that kind of really make the big changes and impacts in the business. It's not like the, I think I'm going to make more money here. It's like, man, this made me feel like shit. I never want to do that again. So it's kind of interesting um, from how I'm kind of looking at it, I think. Well, yeah. And, and especially as a, a freelancer, you know, when, when something, something doesn't work, it's like, it, it really can affect you, right? Like your self-worth and stuff. Like even, even if it's, you know, you sort of firing a client and if they like come back at you and say you're, you know, a piece of shit or whatever, that can, that can hurt, you know? And, and, but I think that's different from, you know, I think like Pilot has quite a large agency. So you have this team and, you know, you kind of all are accountable um, versus being a freelancer. You're kind of like this lone wolf. Um, I'm not, I know you have a bit of a team. Um, I think another thing that's um, really or strikes me as being really important for both freelancers and, and of course agencies is, is a focus on the pipeline. I think we should really have a podcast for, for our agency owners about how to, how to, you know, engineer a pipeline, because then when you get a piece of shit client, you aren't like, Oh no, like I, I need this. You have this full pipeline that you you've been nurturing and um, you know, that kind of thing. So um, that's just a bit of, bit of food for thought. For, for oh me. yeah. And I would say freaking understand your numbers and how much my buddy Max uh, just brought this up to me. And I just, you know, revamped my whole business basically based on how much time I'm spending on things. And I was realizing how much time I spent on writing copy. And I'm like, I could save a lot of money on this. So yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different things to kind of, you know, dabble into in this, you know, agency world without a doubt, but Last thing to, t- yeah. to chat before we wrap up here. I know you've done, I've been on your podcast. It was a, it was a lot okay. of fun. Rich ad, poor ad. Got to shout it out. It's a great, great uh, title uh, for a podcast. I, just, I wanted to ask how that's come about and how, in, how important it's been to, to your client finding your business development sort of cycles on the agency side. Yeah, so this will be fun. So originally we had the Benchmark podcast and uh, that crashed and burned. We had five episodes of that. So where we wanted it similar to Nathan Lodka's software style to where he gets like how much revenue they're making, their MRR, MRR, ARR, that kind of stuff. We want, I love numbers. So I was like, yeah, I'd love to get that. But we found no one wants to share those numbers with us, like an e-com brand. So that idea flopped. Then we came up with the rich ad, poor ad side of things. And that launched in September. Um, we have 107 episodes recorded. We've launched about 35. You know, we've had you, Neil Patel, Billy Jean, Nick Shackelford, Dan Henry on. So, I mean, this is ultimately a funnel to bring in, you know, business for Funnel Dash. Now, I just work with Zach locally. We're good friends here. Um, he has like the ad card and ad funding, but with his authority, and I feel like I have some good, you know, podcasting skills kind of, it's a good collab there. So where I just love being around guys like you, you know, Billy Jean, Opa Tell, it's where it kind of puts me more on the radar. So I haven't really looked at it from a long-term standpoint just yet. It's I'm just trying to kind of build my authority in the industry. Now for Zach, he'd probably have a different answer to where kind of it's an easy way to break the ice to kind of get, you know, Billy Jean on just where he has a huge audience where he could have a Billy Jean ad card or something to where he has a different objectives on that than I do to where I, I like having fun on podcasts, you know, really getting to know people and stuff and making those relationships um, to where, you know, it may be a little different on his end, but it's a good, you know, yin and yang kind of synergy there without a doubt. Cause he looks at it one way, I'm the other way, but I mean, I love it, str- you know, strongly because of who we're having on there and it's just creating really good relationships. I had a guy send me a turtle I had on the podcast, like a, a <laughs> turtle. I, I love it. Uh, yeah. So we'll people pod- I'm waiting for my turtle. I haven't <laughs> received any reptilians at all. No amphibians. 
shouts out jared yeah he's like i'd love to send you something i'm like yeah dude sure he goes oh, you're gonna have two boxes make sure to open them both at the same time and i'm like all right it's not weird at all so i get one box and it has an aquarium on there and i'm like i doubt there's an aquarium in there it's probably a placeholder box and it was in our living room for two weeks and i'm like hey man when's the second box gonna arrive he goes oh i'll go ahead and get a sense and i'm like huh that's weird so i go for lunch and i get home later that day and there's a box on my pad at the door and it had it said reptile on it. I'm like, no way, dude. <laughs> so I had a call in 15 minutes and um, I realized that it was a turtle in there. I opened it and I was like, I felt terrible. A turtle was shipped to begin with. And I'm like, I can't let it stay in here longer. So I have to do this aquarium now. So I called the client like, hey man, something came up. I just had a turtle show up on my doorstep. I got to get it out of here real quick. And he's like, yeah, take your time, take your time. And I'm like, all right, cool, thanks. Um, <laughs> But yeah, now I have a wicked sweet turtle. Her name is PK. You know, I pimped out her aquarium, but it was an odd gift, but it was, I love it. <laughs> is, is it named after PK Subban? No. <laughs> so hockey, I reference? Hockey, game. hockey reference? <laughs> I, I, I've been thinking about that, but now I had a hockey game that night. So I told my girlfriend, you got two things to do tonight. Come up with a name and do some research on turtles. because I don't know anything about them. So she did it all. I <laughs> learned a little bit. It's peekaboo for short, but I call her PK um oh that makes sense not yeah. as cool as hockey yeah it's <laughs> close it's close a little pk but yeah it, th that's a cool little podcast story but we've had guys who are talking about you know sponsoring us which is really exciting um we're getting and then a lot your of growth this is something you told me personally but i want to get it out on the podcast as well and it's something that we have to do more of in 2021 but you've got you, you've gotten pretty decent growth you're getting a couple thousand listens on the podcast oh yeah like and what's your main hack for how you've achieved those okay. rankings Sending people like you, all of our highlights, the email blasts, the thumbnails, the blog posts. So we have three people on the back end who do the, tr it's a tran well, the transcription, it's like a, a, a software or whatever. But we have a website person, a video editor who does the highlights for like little thumbnail snippets for social postings. And then we have somebody who writes the emails, the headlines, and like the social stuff, which is the copywriter. So it's about 70 to $80 to produce an episode right now, currently um but yeah we're having trouble keeping up with bandwidth so we're kind of releasing three a week but it's kind of blown up a little bit more than we were expecting but the biggest hack i would say is just tagging you know you on the social media post because you're probably going to share it at some points where it gets into your audience so we've had to re we've, we've had to rearrange the actual episodes to where billy jean would be coming up in march we're like he has a huge audience let's expedite this one because he has a huge audience there so we're kind of moving them around to kind of really focus more on the audience growth side and we are going to start running ads to it probably in the coming you know week or two um but right now it's kind of been a, a tactical deployment of special guests to kind of break into their audiences if i'm being honest i love it and you're getting them to mail as well are you getting them you're sort of giving them clear instructions on what you want them to do um i can be better at that probably yeah, but no i'll send hard. them the email like the highlight snippet the link to the podcast then i'll sometimes tag them on the actual funnel dash post or whatnot i try and give them as much as possible but i mean it's easier for someone to click share versus upload their own thing about it so i'm kind of learning that it's just easier to tag them in something because they're going to share it from there versus check this out y'all here's you know do it themselves because we're all busy i you know i'll probably share this i won't make a post about it but i'll definitely share it <laughs> you know like there we go so <laughs> Nice. I was just, I was just trying to get to that. I love it. Uh, and we'd love to have our podcast guests join us on D2C plus. So we'll be sending you uh, an invite to join us on, on D2C plus as well, where you can be D2C plus is our membership community. Since you ask it, it gives you access to our monthly workshops uh, as well as live podcast appearances and all of our content in our content vault on D2C plus.co. Is that that Snapchat course I just bought yesterday? Yeah. So but you bought that standalone. You bought it as a standalone. So you yeah. don't actually have access to DC. But you know what? We are going to bequeath you uh, uh, membership now that you've appeared on the podcast, because that's part of the value proposition is that people like you are part of the community. I would love that, man. Yeah, because I was like, I want this one course. I'm like, let me see what other ones they have before I do the the, the 99 a month, I think it was. Let me yeah. see what else I got cooking. So I was like, let me get that for now. But yeah, me and Andrew both got one from Monster Agency. So we're like, dude, I'm trying to spice up the Snapchat game. So you know. I love it. Well, you got the best two teachers coming up in uh, in just T minus 10 days. KG and I actually have to write a few emails this afternoon uh, to get a few more people on it. But yeah, no, it's been going great. And it's just great to work with Van again. It's just great to re bring back these people in your life that you meet. And I just got to say that I just can't wait till we can meet again uh, and, and have a few drinks over a mastermind in the future again. For real, man. I'm, I'm am for them. I need to get out of here. You know, to Mexico is fun, but I, I need to get out of here. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Texas rebel, true Texas rebel. Uh, love it. Anything to finish off there, KG? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. So we 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 like to. There's a wrap up question we like to ask, which is, uh, if you had, if someone just bequeathed you with fifty thousand dollars in addition to DTC plus, um, how would you spend that in your business over the next uh, quarter, two quarters, year, etc.? Man, I would record the most outrageous marketing videos, and I'd probably try and turn that fifty k into four to five hundred k. So, I mean, I could easily with that, I could easily have like seven to eight crazy marketing videos, and two of them are gonna hit the jackpot. I swear. So, yeah. Yeah, we me, didn't talk about that. We published one of your crazy marketing videos yeah. uh, in one of our newsletters a while ago. Oh, yeah. And I think that's a really good insight is that sort of like real standout content is really what matters these days in a lot of ways. Talk a little bit about making that, that post and, and what that brought to you. Yeah, that was, that was nuts. It went viral on Twitter, of all things. Um, and then in the Facebook ad buyer community, if you all saw it, it's like the, the laptop with all the Apple screens. You got Jarvis so cool. talking about how good your ROAS is and stuff. That was, that was fun. But yeah, my buddy came to me. Um, he goes, hey, we're doing more VFX videos. I'm like, what is that? He sent me a little screenshot or a video of one. I'm like, I want that. So originally I was like, hey, I just want one for me. I was on the couch being cool and stuff. And he goes, you can probably make a marketing related. I'm like, I don't have to. And he kind of talked me into doing it. So he came up with the whole idea behind it. It was going to be ads in 2050, basically. Um, and yeah, I, so I had green screens on my phone, my laptop. So I did 60 frames per second, just record all the stuff, um, sent it to him. He sent it to his guy wherever he could be, Bangladesh, Egypt, Dubai, no idea, to be honest. Um, and then he just kind of edited everything and made it look crazy good. We had to hire a guy who sounded like Jarvis to read out a script based on ads and stuff. It was quite a process, but, you know... I'm trying to get him more leads. I think I got like 60 or 70 leads, but there's so many freaking to go through. And it's not a cheap video, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty, um, they're probably starting at 2,500, 3K. And that's for maybe some 30 seconds, if that. Um, Cause we have some guys who use it for brands, uh, you know, personal branding. It can be used for anything. I'm trying to test more e-com products with it. Like cosmetics have colors pop and stuff where it'll be a little more cheap there, but it's, it's very thumb stopping. So I'm trying to find a way to kind of leverage those and monetize it in my own way as well. Cause I'm kind of partnering with him to where I'll get a commission for all the ones he commits, but I also want to implement them for my business. And I'm probably going to run that one in a freaking ad. I don't know. Who knows? You said 2,500 to three K, right. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, which is crazy because it's, you know, I, I'm in contact with some, with some other bigger, big creative agencies and things like that. And they're, you know, there, there's a, there's a type of client that that is paying 25 to $30,000 for, you know, TV worthy spots or, or, you know, specifically styled things. It's like that scale of video production uh, is, can be so massive, but it's, but there are so many great purveyors. And I, you're talking about Andrew Moles from monster. Uh, no, this is my buddy, Alex Livian and he's an over in LA. Okay, cool. Uh, but yeah, there's just so much that's possible with video now, uh, that I think, yeah, investing 50 K into some high end video content is the way to go. Great. You win, you win the, uh, D to C plus membership. Congratulations. Woo! Not the $50,000. Of course you just missed that. <laughs> oh, damn it, one call away. <laughs> You're so close. <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Uh, this will be out in a few weeks and, uh, yeah, look forward to, uh, having you share it when it goes out. Yeah, for sure, man. I'll blow this baby up. Nice. <laughs> Love it. Okay, let's blow up 2021. <laughs> okay, bye. I guess. Peace.